I started touring in a band around the time I was 15 years old. I was in a bunch of bands, but the first band I really started doing a lot with was a punkish band, Trees. The drummer of Trees was my friend Shane. We used to be in two separate bands that briefly toured together also, but then he joined Trees. And this is where this story starts. After one of the Trees practice sessions, Shane told me he met some guy online named Ryan, who way back then was internet famous. He was older than us and wanted to put together a metal band, or a metal core, hardcore metal band. So Shane wanted to know if I could play metal. The goal was to gear up for this longer tour that this band that didn't currently exist would go on. That this guy Ryan, who I had never met, would book. So I asked Shane, why would this guy Ryan, the singer, screamer, want us to be in his band and we're not even in the same state? Shane said, he's under house arrest. He stabbed some guy or something and now he has an ankle bracelet so he can't leave his house. We'd have to drive to California, but he would pay for the gas and give us food. At this point in my life, I was so hungry, so desperate to make something happen. I didn't even question it. So I said, I'm in. Shane said he knew this guy Cody from the hardcore scene and this guy had a truck and he was also going to be in the band, the other guitar player. We practiced at this guy Cody's house a couple of times to learn the songs and then the next weekend, the three of us and some other random guy, a friend of Cody's, got into a truck and drove to California for the first time. I didn't really know them at all, so it was like going on a road trip with total strangers, but I knew Shane, our drummer, so we drive the four and a half, five hours to get to Ryan's house in California. I guess it was his mom's house. We set up all the gear pretty much right away and start practicing. It was the first time we ever heard Ryan scream. He didn't really seem very interested in how the music sounded when we practiced, which caught me by surprise. He seemed more interested in knowing if we could write new songs, probably so we can get out an EP. And honestly, Ryan ended up seeming like a decent guy when we met him. He kept his word, he gave Cody money for gas right away, and he handed us some sandwiches that his mom made. There was water too, but the water had little floating specks in it, so I didn't drink any. He told us a little bit more about why he was under house arrest and how long it had been. And then he told us about this tour he wanted us to go on before we even met each other. The way the timing would have worked out in the future would have been so that he himself couldn't even go because he would still be under house arrest. So he said that somebody would fill in on screaming for him and he would manage the tour from his computer. It was weird. He was very straight edge and obsessed with getting more followers even way back then. He had this whole routine of waking up at a certain time and doing this checklist of stuff in order to maximize his following. And this is way back in the day, way before every four year old in the world wanted to be an influencer. It was the first time I'd ever seen something like that and it was pretty eye opening. It seemed like he was making things happen. So we practiced that day until we went to sleep and then the same thing the next day all day until we had to drive home. At the time I was also working as a chess teacher for a chess company for elementary school kids, not like a high level chess player. So luckily I was able to just do all of my shifts after school every day since there wasn't work on the weekend anyways. So we keep up this whole driving back and forth between the two states for a couple of weeks until one time we got there to California. It was earlier in the day, not at night. And Ryan told us that he wanted to have a party that night, which surprised me, but it turned out the main reason he wanted to do it was because there was another internet famous person person that he wanted to invite over. So we said, sure. It sounded like it was another part of his plan to get the band going. And he said that the party would only be a little kickback, maybe five, 10 people max. So we get in the truck to go pick up this person all the way out in Hollywood, which took a long time to get there, sat in front of the apartment and eventually this person came out and their name was Jeffrey. So we all said, hey, Jeffrey was sitting next to me. So on the drive back, he showed me some pictures of battered meat or something on his phone. Then he told me, you want to know what happens if some bee comes at me? And as he said that, he opened up his clutch bag and there was nothing in it except for a single meat cleaver. He pinched the handle with his thumb and pointer finger and dragged it out slowly just to show me and then put it away. The other two guys in the car caught a glimpse of it and quickly averted their gazes. So when we finally pull around the last corner and drive up to the house, it is packed. There are probably two or 300 people at this place, so many that they obviously can't even fit inside the house. They're scattered all over the front yard and into the street. So we park, muscle our way into the front door and try and find Ryan to bring Jeffrey to him. When we finally get to him, Ryan sees him, rushes up, introduces himself and starts making small talk. So we're all standing in the hallway talking about the new band. When suddenly 
suddenly, people start rushing to try and get to the front door to get out of the house. All of us see the commotion and try and get outside too to see what's happening. In the middle of the street, there are two guys that are yelling at each other, a guy in a button up and a guy in a tank top. Ryan explains that one guy is from one gang and the other is from another. The tank top guy starts walking up to the button up guy and squares up like he's ready to take the fight. The button up guy is too, but then he sees the tank top guy's friends are walking up on the sides. As soon as he realizes that, the button up guy pulls out a knife from his pocket and flicks it open and walks towards them. I didn't realize the car that the tank top guy was standing in front of was his car, so he reached into the car through the window and pulled out a gun. You gotta remember that there were probably more than 100 people outside as this was going down. So as soon as somebody started screaming, he has a gun, everyone started bolting in different directions. Some back into the house, some get in their cars and leave, some jump into the backyard. We are all behind this truck, so we drop into the bed of the truck. When I look back up, the bun up guy is gone, but the tank top guy and his friends are out there laughing. No shots were fired. The party resumes, we go back in the house, and Ryan is pissed that this happened in his house during his house arrest. He starts naming off all the people that disrespected his home, and another hour or so goes by. We're talking in the hall way and the same thing happens again. People start rushing outside again. This time when we get out there, Ryan's nowhere to be found, and it's two guys straight up fist fighting and it looks like it's about to turn into a brawl. It turns out that Ryan got up on top of the roof of his house and started throwing something down at the people fighting as he was screaming at them to leave. I heard somebody say, he's throwing knives. So as soon as I saw that there was a knife on the ground, I immediately tried to get back inside so I wouldn't accidentally get hit by something. So after this second fight, almost everyone left. I didn't see how it ended, but I kept hearing about how some Someone was throwing knives from the roof. There was some more screaming outside, but eventually it was all quiet. We were finally down to the five to ten people that this kickback was supposed to be originally. It was a lot easier to see how trash the house was now that there were so few people there. All of us were sitting in the bedroom. I was in one section with Jeffrey. Ryan was at the computer facing everyone. There was a girl that was sitting in the bed. Shane across from me and a few other random people. It was calm and everyone was just talking until a guy burst in the room, swung the door open, and started screaming at the girl in the bed saying, look, we need to go now. They are coming back. We need to go now. It turns out that guy was the girl's boyfriend, but before she could respond, Jeffrey told him maybe she doesn't want to go with someone who looks like a troll doll. A bunch of the random people started cracking up laughing at this, including the girl herself. So the guy said, fine, you're all just going to die here then. And before he even finished that sentence, he was sprinting out towards the front door to leave. People went back to talking like nothing ever happened. And a little bit later on, Jeffrey asked me, where to get some water. So we walked to the kitchen, which has a big window. At this point, Shane was already there drinking water himself, and he said to Jeffrey, you might want to look at the water first. Because if you remember, the water at this house was cloudy and had some specks in it. So we held up the glass of water to the light. The three of us leaned in at the same time to look at it, and at that moment, it was like time completely froze. Before I heard any sound, all of the glass of the giant window we were standing in front of exploded. There was a loud (laughs) The people that were left in the house started screaming. Shane dropped his drinking glass and bolted to one side. Jeffrey ran into the bathroom and I dropped to the floor onto the glass and tried to crawl into the other room. Then we heard more sounds and more glass shattering. A few of the girls that I didn't know at all were screaming in fear. And then finally when it was over and everything was quiet, I heard someone sniffling crying in the other room. Someone else yelled out, is everyone okay? And then somebody else said, what happened? In response to that, somebody yelled out, they came back. It's like that guy said it was retaliation. I didn't want to stand up right away in case it wasn't over. So I crawled over to where I thought Shane was to see if he was okay. Since the three of us were the only ones standing right in front of the window where it happened. But first I saw Jeffrey and he was more than shaken. He kept repeating, I have to go. I can't be here. I have to go. I have to go. Take me out of here now. I can't be here. The first thing that Ryan heard was that. So he immediately asked us to take Jeffrey home before before we even knew if anyone was outside. Nobody argued, we just accepted it and went to the door. I was the first one to open the front door and stick my head out to see if anyone was out there, but all I saw was a bunch of glass on the floor, which didn't make sense to me because the window they hit us from had all the glass come into the house, so how could there be glass outside? 
Well, it turns out they hit Cody's truck. We opened the doors to hurry up and get inside because we didn't want to be standing out in the open and all the seats were covered in glass. I was on the passenger side, so I was trying to sweep the glass onto the floor of the car so I could sit on it without having a pile of glass underneath me. That's when we realized we didn't have a windshield anymore. So we jumped in, Cody peeled out of there, and I don't know if you guys have ever driven a car without a windshield before, but it's awful. It feels like you can barely keep your eyes open, and of course, we didn't have glasses or anything to block the wind. So we drove slowly in total silence, but we didn't make it very far. We got to the first gas station we saw, pulled over, and tried to sweep all of the glass into a trash can, which also wasn't very effective. This entire time, Jeffrey said nothing, Cody said nothing, but Shane said, what if they come back and Ryan is alone? As soon as he said that, pretty much everyone understood what he meant. Everyone was on the same page to go back. So we start slowly driving back, but now there's some sort of fog that makes it a lot harder to see than before. And the street lights were out, which was weird because we were there maybe 15 minutes ago, but the street lights were on. So it was very dark out there. Cody starts getting a little bit paranoid. So he turns off his headlights and we quietly roll into the spot in front of the house. And as soon as we do that, boom, floodlights kick on powerful ones and we're temporarily blinded for a second. There were at least two cop cars sitting in front of us in the darkness that we didn't see. And from behind, we hear tires screeching as more cop cars come around the corner and block us in from the back. On a speaker, a cop is screaming at us to get out of the car with our fingers laced behind our heads. So I open the door, fall to my knees next to the truck with my fingers laced behind my head with some shards of glass following me out the door onto the floor. I try looking in front of me, but it's a blind light, but I can make out that a cop is walking towards me. I'm still on the ground, on my knees, kneeling in the shards of glass at the side of the truck, and in that moment I remember hoping that this shooting wouldn't make me miss school the next day because I was still in high school. And that's part one. If you think we should make a part two to see how this all plays out, let me know and subscribe by hitting the bell to turn on notifications so you don't miss the next part of the story. These videos take quite a while to make, so in the meantime, if you want to see what I've been doing this whole time that I've been gone from the channel, you'll You'll understand if you check out the link at the top of the description. It's a playlist of some very juicy stories that you can listen to in the background. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know if you want a part two and subscribe.